Amen. Turn with me, please, in your Bibles to Exodus chapter 15. Exodus chapter 15. We'll be looking at Exodus 15, beginning in verse 22, and spanning into uh, chapter 16, verse 21. It says this, Then Moses had Israel, <clears throat> excuse me, Moses had Israel set out from the sea, and they went out into the wilderness of Shur. And they went three days in the wilderness and found no water. And they came to Marah, but they could not drink the waters of Marah, for they were bitter. Therefore, it was named Marah. So the people grumbled at Moses, saying, What shall we drink? And then he cried out to Yahweh, and Yahweh showed him a tree. And he threw it into the waters, and the waters became sweet. And there he set for them a statute and a judgment, and there he tested them. And he said, If you will earnestly listen to the voice of Yahweh your God, and do what is right in his sight, and give ear to his commandments, and keep all his statutes, I will put none of the diseases on you which I have put on the Egyptians, for I, Yahweh, am your healer. And they came to Elam, where there were twelve springs of water and seventy date palms, and they camped there beside the waters. Chapter 16. Then they set out from Elam, and all the congregation of the sons of Israel came to the wilderness of Sin, which is between Elam and Sinai. On the fifteenth day of the second month, after their departure from the land of Egypt, and the whole congregation of the sons of Israel grumbled against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. And the sons of Israel said to them, Would that we had died by the hand of Yahweh in the land of Egypt, when we sat by the pots of meat, and when we ate bread to the full. For you have brought us out into this wilderness to put this whole assembly to death with hunger. Then Yahweh said to Moses, Behold, I will rain bread from heaven for you, and the people shall go out and gather a day's portion every day, that I may test them whether or not they will walk in my law. Now it will be on the sixth day, they shall prepare what they bring in, and it shall be twice as much as they gather daily. So Moses and Aaron said to all the sons of Israel, At evening you will know that Yahweh has brought you out of the land of Egypt. And in the morning you will see the glory of Yahweh, for he hears your grumblings against Yahweh. And what are we that you grumble against us? And Moses said, this will happen when Yahweh gives you meat to eat in the evening and bread to the full in the morning. For Yahweh hears your grumblings, which you grumble against him. And what are we? Your grumblings are not against us, but against Yahweh. Then Moses said to Aaron, Say to all the congregation of the sons of Israel, Come near before Yahweh, for he has heard your grumblings. Now it happened as Aaron spoke to the whole congregation of the sons of Israel that they turned towards wilderness. And behold, the glory of Yahweh appeared in the cloud. And Yahweh spoke to Moses, saying, I have heard the grumblings of the sons of Israel. Speak to them saying, At twilight you shall eat meat, and in the morning you shall be filled with bread, so that you shall know that I am Yahweh your God. So it happened that at evening that the quails came up and covered the camp, and in the morning there was a layer of dew around the camp. Then the layer of dew evaporated, and behold, on the surface of the wilderness there was a fine flake-like thing, fine as the frost on the ground. And the sons of Israel saw it and said to one another, What is it? For they did not know what it was. And Moses said to them, It is the bread which Yahweh has given you to eat. This is what Yahweh has commanded. Gather it, every man, as much as he should eat. You shall take an omer, a piece, according to the number of persons, each of 
each of you has in his tent. And the sons of Israel did so. Some gathered much and some little. And they measured it with an omer. And he who had gathered much had no excess. And he who had gathered little had no lack. And every man gathered as much as he should eat. And Moses said to them, Let no man leave any of it until morning. But they did not listen to Moses. And some left part of it until morning. And it bred worms and became foul. And Moses was angry with them. So they gathered it morning by morning, each man as much as he should eat. But the sun would grow hot and it would melt. The title of this sermon is Goodness and Grumbling. Goodness and Grumbling. I hope it's apparent why that is the title. I desire, church, that this morning that you would trust God in your trials. That you would trust God in your trials because that's really the lesson that God is teaching the Israelites and teaching us as well. You know, there's a story of the son of an Indian chief who had uh, reached the age when he had to prove that he was a man. He could become a, a chief as well as his father. Now, part of, of the testing required him to spend a night alone in a forest full of wild animals and to survive. All night, the wild animals gathered around the boy, growling and, and snarling. But if he ran away, he would fail the test. And even though he was frightened, the boy was determined to stay. The night went on, and finally the morning came, and the sun began to rise. And, of course, the wild animals went away with the sun. And as the boy began looking around in that morning light, much of his surprise, he saw that his father was not far behind him with an arrow in his bow ready to shoot. See, despite the boy's fear, his father was there the whole time, there to protect his son from harm in the midst of the test. Just like the Israelites, God puts us in testing, doesn't he? Testing situations to teach us to trust in him so that our faith might grow. 1 Corinthians 10, 11 speaks of the testings of Israel. In 1 Corinthians 10, 11, it says, Now these things happen to them as an example. And they were written for our instruction. So as you read the Old Testament, as we walk through Exodus, it's written for your instruction, dear saint. You should learn from the mistakes of Israel so that you might not repeat them and learn from the good things as well. You see, what happened to Israel in the wilderness teaches us how to live for Christ today. And just as they crossed the Red Sea, they sang a worship song, right? We saw that last week. But as soon as they were done singing that song, they walked into the wilderness. And just as them, even this morning, those of us who has ta have tasted the grace and the, the salvation of God, we will end our morning together with a song and we will go into the wilderness. You know, it's one thing to sing praises to Christ on a Sunday, but it's quite another thing to live out that faith when we are confronted with the difficulties of just ordinary life. Charles Spurgeon said that the wilderness of this world is like the Oxford and Cambridge for God's students. There we go to school and he teaches them and he trains them so that they would graduate into the promised land. Paul said, in Acts 14, 22, 
that through many tribulations we must enter the kingdom of God. There's no other way. God places us, church, in these difficult tests to stretch our faith in him. We must trust him more. Dear Christian, you must trust him more, especially in trials. We will see this morning that the, the lesson of this faith, of this trust in God, takes on three aspects, that we must trust God's timing, we must trust God's kindness, and trust God's commands. Trust God's timing, kindness, and commands. First of all, we need to trust God's timing. This is the lesson that he was teaching the Israelites. Verses 22 through 24 of Exodus 15. We see here that Moses had Israel set out from the Red Sea in verse 22. They went out to the wilderness of Shur and they went three days into the wilderness. They found no water. They came to Marah. There was nothing but bitter water there. That's why it's called Marah. That means bitter. And so the people grumbled at Moses and they said, what shall we drink? Now, we can understand the state of the Israelites. God took them out into the wilderness. And that word for wilderness is a desert. It's a dry terrain, strong, dry winds, little vegetation. And it is there in that setting. Remember, they don't have a Winnebago. It's just them and some tents. And they're, they're just hoofing it on foot. It is in that setting that, of course, water is a top priority. It is a critical necessity just for life. And we see the Israelites here having gone without water for a few days. They, they, they come to these, to these, uh, these lakes of Mara, and uh, they think, great, we have water finally. And they, you can imagine, dip down and uh, uh, grab a drink, and immediately they have to spit it out. What now? Not only am I thirsty, but it's like God's taunting me. Brought, bringing me to this place where it's just bitter. What a huge disappointment. And this, of course, is no small difficulty. Of course, this is cause for crying out to God. Of course. But it does not say that they cried out to God, does it? It says that they grumbled. Grumbling, the Hebrew word is to murmur against. It is to express resentment, dissatisfaction, and anger, and complaint by grumbling. In Numbers 14, Verse 2 and 9, it is described there, grumbling is described as rebellion against God. So it is, grumbling is a rebellion of the heart. It is this stance of, uh, of standing in judgment over God and to rebuke him for what he has done. That's what the word means. You are being judgmental to God. And this word grumbling, it just literally, it comes out in, in half-muted tones of hostile opposition. It is the anger and the rebellion of the human heart that bubbles up through the mouth. That's what grumbling is. Now, the grumbling of Israel is contrasted to the right response of Moses. Verse 25 then he, that is Moses, cried out to Yahweh. Moses, he appeals to God's nature, his promises. He pleads for help from God. That's the word. That is the right position of God's people. Humble request 
not prideful judgments and accusations. This is what Moses did. He humbly requested of God. And yet, the people continue in their grumbling. And what does God do in response to the grumbling of the people mediated through the pleading of Moses? Verse 25. Then he cried out to Yahweh, and Yahweh showed him a tree. And he threw it into the waters, and the waters became sweet. And there he set for them a statute and a judgment, and there he tested them. You see, God was good to a grumbling people. Now, scholars and scientists have tried endlessly to explain this event through natural uh, processes of some special tree, or maybe there's a trunk where they filter the water through the tree, tree trunk or something ridiculous like that. But it makes no sense for the setting, the trees that are there in that climate, and the amount of people that were present that needed a drink. This was nothing short of a divine, supernatural work of God. Just as it was with the, red, the, the crossing of the Red Sea. It was divine, supernatural intervention. It is a gracious miracle. And we see why God does this to begin with. Verse 25 again. The waters became sweet in the middle of verse 25. There he set for them a statute and a judgment. And there he tested them. Verse 26. And he said, if you will earnestly listen to the voice of Yahweh your God and do what is right in his sight and give ear to his commandments and keep all his statutes, I will put none of the diseases on you which I have put on the Egyptians. For I, Yahweh, am your healer. Why did God do this? Why did he allow them to go three days without water and then bring them there to, uh, to the waters of Marah uh, for them to experience that bitterness and then only to give them a miracle to, uh, to make that water sweet instead of bitter so that they could drink it. Why did God do this? It was to test them. To test them. God tested the Israelites. Uh, we, we see this in, in verse 25 of chapter 15. We see this also in chapter 16, verse 4. He gives them... He rains bread from heaven, and the people go out and gather a day's portion every day that I may test them. And we're going to see specifically when it comes to the manna, the instructions. We'll see that next week. But God often tested the Israelites to test, to test when it comes from God to his people. It is to try the limits of someone. It is to find their breaking point. And those of you in the middle of a test and a trial this morning might be saying, I think I found the breaking point. I think I'm there already. That's what testing is. It is to find out that breaking point. Not that God would learn, but that he would manifest that to you and make it visible. God was testing the limits of when they would stop doing, verse 26. Where's the limit? Where is the breaking point when you will stop listening to the voice of Yahweh? Where you will stop doing what is right in His sight? Where you will stop giving ear to His commandments? And where you will stop keeping all of His his statutes? That's the test. I need to find the limits of your faith, the limits of your devotion. And Christian, that's what God does in your life. He is is helping you find that breaking point. Yet at the same time, not breaking you. This is why God allows trials. For the Israelites, the breaking point was just a few days without water. Now, God always does this with his people. He always tests the limits of his people to find the limits 
of their devotion and faith. And often, if we're honest, we sadly find our breaking point to be not as far as we had thought. Right? It doesn't take much for you to sin, does it? It doesn't take much for you to doubt and to fear, does it? We give into temptation. We give into doubt with, uh, with, with much more speed than we would think and hope. Psalm 26. Psalm 26, verse 2. David invites testing from God. He says, test me, O Yahweh. And try me. Refine my mind and my heart. That's what he's doing. Christian, you need to have the heart of David that you would welcome the test. Now I know it's not fun. But oh, if, that, if, the, if the testing means that on the other end I will be more pure for him. My mind and my heart will be refined in faith and devotion to him. If that's the end result, then Lord, do whatever you got to do. Church, we need to humble ourselves under the testing of God, under the trials that he places us in. That must be our mindset. Why? Psalm 26, 2 alludes to this. And Exodus 15 says it explicitly, because God is your healer. You see, as as Christians, we fail these tests, right? By by lacking faith in God or by sinning against him. And and we ask, why would God test me in this way? I, I I know I will fail. I know I'm weak. He knows how weak I am. Why would he do this to me? Christian, it's because he's your healer. You see, in order for a physician to heal the body, the illness must first be known. God places you in trial in order to show you what sins are still within you, to diagnose. And then as we fail the test, a diagnosis is made by God in his word, and the Lord begins his purifying Physician work. He heals our souls from the sickness of indwelling sin. And then, back in Exodus 15, then in his grace and his goodness, after he tests us and puts us in trial and brings us through the other end, God is faithful to give times of refreshment. Verse 27. Then they came to Elam, where there were 12 springs of water and 70 date palms, and they camped there besides the waters. Now, I don't know about you, but my mind goes to, why, Lord, did you not just lead them to Elam first? Right? Right? Why not just go there first? Why go to Mara, to bitterness first? Why that test? Why not just go straight to the, to the palm trees, right? And, and, and the fountains of water. John Calvin said that God might have given them sweet water to drink at first, but he planned that through the bitter water, he would show them the bitterness that lingered within their hearts. You see, God could have. He could have brought them straight to the, to the oasis, right? But the timing of God is perfect, Christian, to bring you through trials first and then on to times of refreshment. So trust God in your trial. And specifically, trust his timing. 
Now, as God graciously gave that time of refreshment, he quickly moves them on to the next stage of the wilderness where they would learn to trust God's kindness. That's secondly this morning. Trust God's kindness. Chapter 16, verses 1 through 3 says, They set out from Elam, and all the congregation of sons of Israel came to the wilderness of sin. That is not sin as in like rebelling against God's sin. That's just sin as in short for Sinai. The wilderness of, of sin, which means, by the way, that they're not far from their destination, Mount Sinai, but as we'll see, because of their sin, they have to wander for 40 years, even though they're right there on the doorstep. Uh, they, they come to the wilderness of Sin, which is between Elam and Sinai, on the 15th day of the second month after their departure from the land of Egypt. And the whole congregation of the sons of Israel, again, grumbled against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. And the sons of Israel said to them, Would that we had died by the, by the hand of Yahweh in the land of Egypt. When we sat by the pots of meat, when we ate bread to the full, for you have brought us into the wilderness uh, to put this whole assembly to death by hunger. You just brought us here to starve to death. So we're about 30 days into the Israelite journey after the, the Exodus event. They've already seen God's gracious response to their sinful grumbling at the waters of Mara, and then at the waters of Elim. They've experienced the good of, goodness of God by providing plenty of water up to that point. But once again, we see how deeply implanted within the human heart is this complaining attitude. And if we're honest, that grumbling attitude is implanted, the, re the roots go deeper than what we think. Doesn't it, Christian? You see, their discomfort made them foolish in their thinking. They would, they, their thinking was ridiculous. They would rather die a quick death by the hand of God than a slow death by hunger. You see, they were agonizing in their hunger and they wanted it to just be over already. You see, when, when memory is short, our hearts become ungrateful. Notice, too, their hopelessness. The only option for them on either side is death. We're going to die. We might as well have died a quick death back in Egypt. Right? There's no option of God showing up and providing. It's just, we're dead. That's it. We've been brought out here to die a slow death. God is cruel. But the foolishness is that they would rather be back in Egypt under the evil Pharaoh than out in the wilderness with Yahweh. That's the foolishness of it all. You see, they concluded that at least in Egypt they had food to eat, which is not true. But here in the wilderness, they were starving to death. And they were really saying, if you boil it down, it would have been better if God never saved me at all. Christian, have you ever been there? Have you? Have you ever been at that place in your soul where you are so hopeless and even bitter against God? Where thoughts of, you know what? It'd probably be easier and better if God never saved me at all. Oh, God, forgive us for that thought. But it happens. You look at your life as a believer and it seems so difficult. There's so many things that the world can do that, the, that, the, that Christ commands you not to do. God commands you to give to him even when it doesn't seem you'll be able to pay all the bills. Christ calls you to remain pure until marriage. God places you in a difficult marriage and calls you to be faithful to him and your spouse. These are difficult circumstances. And it's easy to think that life before Christ was better. It was better. It would, be, it would have been better if God never saved me at all. 
Dear child of God, you are believing a lie. And like the Israelites, you have forgotten the kindness of your God. We see the kindness of God first in that the, the, the reality is that they already had food. If you just briefly look at Exodus 17, verse 3, it says that the people thirsted there for water again, and they grumbled again against Moses and said, they're, they're going to out themselves. Why now have you brought us from Egypt to put us and our children and our livestock to death with thirst? So later on, they're thirsty again, and it comes out to us, they actually have livestock. So why are they complaining? Why are they grumbling? We have no food. Right? Oh, we get that way, don't we? You see, the Israelites wanted a free ride. They wanted a free ride. They wanted to receive all the benefits of being God's people as long as there was no personal cost or sacrifice. They didn't want to give up their livestock. They expected God to just dole out what they needed day by day. And for them to not experience any dip in personal happiness or satisfaction or pleasure or comfort. That is not the path of the Christian. To be the people of God, there will always be personal cost and sacrifice. One way that people in the church most often, I would say, do this today is with their time. You see, Christ comes to us as believers and he demands, not asks, demands, by the way, our time in reading, prayer, sitting under preaching, sitting under teaching, fellowshipping with the saints, service in the, in the church. And then we turn around and we grumble. I have no time for all that. Don't you know how stressed out I am? I got no time for all that. I'll give, you, I'll give you one hour, Lord. That's all I got. Does that sound familiar? You see, Christian, if that is your mindset, you're looking for a free ride. And you're not willing to pay the cost and sacrifice for him. But you see, the, the reality is, like the Israelites, we do have the time. Right? We do. We just spend it on other things that are not God's first priorities. Things like riches and pleasures and idols like my bank account and my friendships and my family and my comfort and my, my, uh, my relaxation. We have the time. It's just we want a free ride. And as the Israelites grumbled, despite that, God still responds with kindness. And isn't he that way with us? Verses 4 through 8. Then Yahweh said to Moses, Behold, I will rain bread from heaven for you, and the people shall go out and gather a day's portion Every day that I may test them, there's that word again, whether or not they will walk in my law. Now it will be on the sixth day that they shall prepare what they bring in, and it will be twice as much as they gather daily. We'll look at that next week in the law of the Sabbath. So Moses and Aaron said to all the sons of Israel, at evening you will know that Yahweh has brought you out of the land of Egypt. And in the morning you will see the glory of Yahweh, for he hears your grumblings against Yahweh. And what are we that you grumble against us? You see, despite the petty grumblings of his people, God still responds with goodness and kindness. 
Four times it says, God hears your grumblings. Verse 7, verse 8, verse 9, and then again in verse 12. Again and again, God hears our grumblings. And yet, what does he do in response to hearing our grumblings? He's kind. How kind that every day's need will be met personally by God day by day. That's what he says in verse 4 and 5. Each day you're going to have enough and I'll personally see to it. That's his promise to us, church. Every day you will have enough. And he personally sees to it that you will have enough for the day. How kind he is. How kind that he would, uh, that, that this same God who brought them out of Egypt is the same glorious God who is still with them the next morning. Verse 6 and 7. He says, At evening you will know that Yahweh has brought you out of the land of Egypt, and then in the morning you will see the glory of Yahweh. What's he saying? I'm going to show you that I'm still the same God tonight, and then tomorrow morning when you wake up, I'm going to be there too. That's what he says. How kind of God to be faithful, day in and day out. How kind that what God provides to the Israelites, is exactly what they grumbled for. Verse 8. What does he give them? This will happen when Yahweh gives you meat to eat in the evening and bread to the full in the morning. What did they complain for? Meat and bread. So he doesn't say, you know, you wanted meat and bread. I'm impatient with you. I'm going to make sure you don't die, but, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll give you bugs to eat instead. That's all you're getting. Just eat a bunch of ants, right? Because I got to teach you a lesson. That's not what he does. He gives the best in response to our griping. Oh, how kind he is. And by the way, that meat was quail. We learned that in verse 13. And that quail was a delicacy to the Egyptians. And not only that, but the bread that he provides was delicious Sweet bread that tasted like honey. Verse 31, at the end of the chapter. You see, this reminds us of what our Lord and Savior said. When we come to God with our needs. Matthew 7, he says, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened to you. Don't grumble. Just ask. For everyone who asks receives, and he who seeks finds, and to him who knocks it will be open. Then he reasons with us. What man is there among you who, when his son asks for a loaf of bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, he will not give him a snake, will he? So then if you, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your father, who is in heaven, give what is Good to those who ask him. Christian, he is good. You just got to ask and then wait. Verse 9 and 9 through 12, it goes on. One more act of kindness of God is that in response to the sinful grumbling of his people, God gives the greatest thing. Verse 9 through 12. Then Moses said to Aaron, say to all the congregation of the sons of Israel, come near before Yahweh, for he has heard your grumblings. Now it happened as Aaron spoke to the whole congregation of the sons of Israel that they turned toward the wilderness and behold, the glory of Yahweh appeared in the cloud. Yahweh spoke to Moses. Now, what kind of response would you have to a grumbling people? Right? Uh, Yahweh tells Moses to bring the people near. Remember, the, the last thing that just happened is they're grumbling. And Yahweh says, okay, bring them, bring them close. Bring them close. I would think that this is when God will go ahead and take his people out to the spiritual woodshed for an attitude adjustment. He can bust out the whip. And have some corporal punishment. Give him a, give him a swift uh, alignment. 
let's say. That's what I would do. Because I'm just a man. It's time for discipline, right? Well, maybe another time, but here, what does God do? Verse 12. I've heard the grumblings of the sons of Israel speak to them. At twilight you shall eat meat. And in the morning you shall be filled with bread. So that you will know that I am Yahweh your God. What does he do? He graciously gives. God richly pours out his kindness upon his people. Even when they doubt him and grumble against him. So much is his graciousness in his provision that he says they shall be filled. Christian, he brings the Israelites to him and he shows, him his, shows them his glory. And in the glory, in them, through that glory, he provides richly. What is that saying? Christian, you can see the glory of God every day. If you would just look. Where? Every time you sit down for a meal. Every time your car starts up. Every time your gas tank gets filled. I know it's a little harder to get there. But the fact that you can is his kindness. The fact that you're here means that that happened. Every time that you lay down to sleep and have rest for a day. That's his kindness. And he is manifesting his glory through his kindness. Every paycheck should produce worship in the heart of the believer. Why does he provide for you? Same reason he provided for the Israelites. So that you will see his glory and know that he is your God. He's yours, Christian. This great God, beyond all measure, beyond all calculable understanding. The God who, as we just begin to study, our brains begin to hurt. The God who cannot be confined by anything, who is transcendent, who is everywhere present, who knows all, who accomplishes whatever he wills. That God is your God, and you are his people. And so, you can trust him. Trust his kindness in your trials. Now, even while God showed his kindness to provide that provision, it came with instructions. And the Israelites needed to learn that God's limitations are also good. And that they should trust God's commands. That's the third point. Trust God's commands. Verse 13 through 15. So it happened that evening that the quails came up and covered the camp. And in the morning there was a layer of dew around the camp. Then the layer of dew evaporated. Behold, on the surface of the wilderness there was a fine flake-like thing. Fine as a frost on the ground. And the sons of Israel saw it. And said to one another, what is it? For they did not know what it was. And Moses said to them, it is the bread which Yahweh had given you to eat. Now, once again, just like the Red Sea and the waters of Marah, uh, again, scholars and critics have tried to strip the miraculous out of this text by natural explanations. But the only explanation that meets all the criteria of the biblical account is that this was nothing short of a miracle of God. As Moses said, it is the bread which Yahweh had given. 1 Corinthians 10.3 speaks of this bread, that he, and he calls it spiritual food that was given to the Israelites, which means that it was, a, it was food that was caused and produced by the divine spirit of God. It was supernatural food, bread from God. 
Now, this great work of quail and the manna, this bread, comes with some stipulations. Verse 16. This is what Yahweh has commanded. Gather it, gather of it every man as much as he should eat. You shall take an omer apiece according to the number of persons each of you has in his tent. And the sons of Israel did so. Some gathered much, some gathered little. And they measured it with an omer. And he who had gathered much had no excess, and he who had gathered little had no lack. Every man gathered as much as he should eat. What's he saying here? God's command was clear. It's just take only what you need. An omer was little more than about two quarts, uh, what would fit in a small basket. But uh, we, we need to ask this question because it seems like there's a contradiction. There was some who gathered little and some who gathered much. But God told them to only have for themselves an omer worth. And not only that, but we read on, verse 16 through 18, and we see that uh, someone who gathered little had no lack, and then the one who gathered more had no excess. How do those things work? If somebody gathers maybe less than an omer, how is it that they do not lack an omer? Somebody gathers more than a basket full. How is it that they have nothing left over? Turn with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 8. Second Corinthians chapter 8. The intent of this passage is found in verse 7. Let's look at that. 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 7. Here's the, the driving point of this whole passage. Verse 7, But at, just as you abound in everything, in faith and word and knowledge and in all earnestness, and in the love we inspired in you, see that you abound in this gracious work also. Okay, well then what gracious work? There's all these other things that they're abounding in. What is lacking in, in what they're abounding in? What, what gracious work do they need to give attention to? Well, let's look back up at verse 1 through 5 to get the setting. It says, Now, brothers, we make known to you the grace of God which has, given, has been given in the churches of Macedonia. That in a great testing, man, there's that word again, in a, in a great testing by affliction, their abundance of joy and their deep poverty abounded into the richness of their generosity. For I testify that according to their ability and beyond their ability, they gave of their own accord, begging us with much urging for the grace of sharing in the ministry to the saints. And, and this, not as we had expected, but they first gave themselves to the Lord and to us by the will of God. What is he saying? The saints of Macedonia gave liberally to the needs of the church, even though they did not have much. And if you remember... Verse 2, this was a test. So the poverty, the hard times that came upon the Macedonians was a test from God to see what they would do. And they passed the test. Because out of their poverty and out of the abundance of joy and love in their heart, they gave liberally to the needs of the saints. Now, Paul brings that up because Paul is now calling on the Corinthians to step up now. 
Paul is calling on the Corinthians to step up. He goes on to exhort them to fulfill the promises and commitments that they had made uh, to give to the needs of the church. Verses 8 through 12. I am not speaking this as a command, but as proving through the earnestness of others the sincerity of your love also. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though being rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you through his poverty might become rich. He's saying... This is what Jesus did for us. And I give my opinion in this matter, for this is profitable for you, who were the first to begin a year ago, not only to do this, but also to desire to do it. To do what? To provide for the needs of the saints. But now complete doing it also, just so that just as there was a readiness to to desire it, so there may be also the completion of it from what you have. He says, it's, it's nice that you want to give, but you got to do it. you got to follow through. Fulfill your commitment that you made to the Lord. Verse 12, for if the readiness is present, it is acceptable according to what a person has, not according to what he does not have. So he's exhorting them. You made a commitment. You love the saints. you got to follow through. And you got to give. It's your turn now, he says to the Corinthians. He goes on. Verse 13 through 15. For this is not for the relief of others and for your affliction, but by way of equality. At this present time, your abundance being a supply for their need. So that their abundance may also be a become a supply for your need. And then listen to this, that there may be equality. As it is written, verse 15, he who gathered much did, he who gathered much did not have too much, and he who gathered little had no lack. What is this saying? Verse 13 through 15 tells us that the framework of Christian giving is found in Exodus 16. You see, there will be times when you, Christian, gather much. And at the same time, your brother or sister in Christ is only able to gather little. It is those times where everyone should have enough. How does that happen? By the giving of the saints. By the generosity of the church. That's how it is accomplished. So we get a window into what was happening in the dynamic of the Israelites in the wilderness. These people were going out with these baskets and gathering up the manna from the ground... And some were only able to gather little. Maybe they were uh, physically incapable or sick or whatever the situation. They were only able to gather little. And then you have this other person who has heaps of manna that they were able to gather. How is it that this person had nothing extra and this person had enough? Because he gave his extra to that one that did not have enough. That's how it happened. Again, there will be times when you gather much and your brother or sister gathers little. It is those times that you, Christian, must step up and share what you have with the body of Christ. Because, because there will be times when you, too, will have your turn to be counting on the generosity of your brother or sister. Right? It's going to come around. There will come a time when you will need and be counting on the generosity of others. But if what comes to your mind, if what comes to your mind is, well, you know, I'll I'll just save up my money and make sure that I don't ever need that kind of help. Verse 19 through 21 of Exodus 
16, as we close, guards us from that mindset. Back in Exodus 16. You might say, well, it's nice that you want me to be all generous and, and you know, to, to give, but, and, and you know, that, this, what goes around comes around kind of a mindset. I'll just save up so that I don't have to depend on others or the church. Verse 19 through 21. Moses said to them, let no man leave any of it until morning. But they did not listen to Moses, and some left part of it until morning. And it bred worms and became foul, and Moses was angry with them. So they gathered it morning by morning, every man as much as he should eat. But the sun would grow hot, and it would melt. God wrote into this miracle that they could not save up. Remember, this manna was the kind provision of God. They were to take what they needed for each day. And so that means that provision is not excess and provision is not poverty. Provision is enough for the day. When it comes to what is needed, God is more able to sustain you than what you think. Some Christians think that they are wiser than God and they decide to budget their way out of faith. They save their way out of dependence on God. Christ speaks to this, Matthew 6, when he tells us how to pray, he says, pray in this way, our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Then what does he say? Give us this day our daily bread. Where does that come from? Exodus 16. Just give me enough. Just give me enough so I can make sure that your name is hallowed in this world. And that your will is done on earth as it is in heaven. Just keep me alive so I can keep on singing your praises, God. That's all I need. Is that your mindset? Now, of course, it's not wrong to save some. Proverbs tell us that it is wise to save some. But there is a point when it becomes hoarding. When our safety net is so big that there is no need for faith in God to provide. And I offer you a warning this morning, dear Christian. That just as Yahweh caused what was sinfully saved to become spoiled and foul for the Israelites, he knows also how to get you to stop trusting in your riches. And what's the solution? Well, later on in that same chapter of Matthew 6 where Jesus tells us to pray just for our daily bread, he goes on to tell us, do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy, where thieves break in and steal But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in or steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. We remember that just as God provided bread from heaven, he provides for us each day. And not only this, but just as he provided for the physical hunger of the Israelites, he also provided for the, he provided also the true bread from heaven to provide for the spiritual hunger of mankind. But we're going to see that next week. It should be a glorious time. Christ, the bread of heaven. But I want to remind you, just as we close, there is one who faced testing and stood the test. Our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. As the Israelites were in the wilderness for 40 years, Christ, too, was in the wilderness for 40 days and nights. But where the Israelites failed their tests over and over, Christ succeeded. He did not complain that his father had failed to provide for him. Rather, he just trusted that the father would take care of him. If a test, think of this, if a test is to find the limit the breaking point of one's faith and devotion in God. We can say that Christ's breaking point of his devotion and faith in his Father was never found because he never gave in. He never failed the test, though we do every day. And when the sinner places his faith in Jesus Christ, that perfection of our Savior, 
like a pure white robe is draped over the sinner. And God is pleased with you, Christian, because you're in Christ. So I ask you, how will you respond to God's test? Will you grumble? Will you tell God that what he's doing in your life is wrong? Or will you just trust in your God? Trust that his timing is best, that though it is difficult now, God is accomplishing his work in you and will bring times of refreshment when the time is right. And trust your God, that he is a good and kind God, that he did not save you simply to neglect you. And trust that when God commands you to do something, it is the best thing for you. Whether it is giving to the church, helping another believer, humbly serving the local church, loving and, and, and leading a difficult wife, helping and respecting a cruel husband, staying pure in an immoral world, or standing for truth when you're the only one. If you obey God, it is better. And you can trust him that he will never leave you nor forsake you. So trust God in your trials. Let's pray. Stand with me as we pray. Oh God, would you help us? I think of the fathers especially. Would you put steel in the spine of these men? That they would not waver in their devotion and faith in you, God. Oh, there's plenty of reason to doubt. There's plenty of reason to worry if we, if we don't think of you, if you're, not, if you're not in the picture. But God, you are ever present with your people. And you place us in these tests so that we would grow in our faith and devotion to you. Oh God, may the fathers that are with us and that hear this, may they be compelled to greater devotion, to greater faith in you despite their circumstance. And God, we pray for your people that we would trust you with our whole being. No matter what the world might tell us is true, it is a lie. Let every man be a liar and God alone be the source of truth. Lord, we look to you and we trust you. We thank you that you are a good God, worthy of our trust. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen.